Hi, everybody. This is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And I hope you enjoy this new show, whether you're viewing it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the episode. I do want to thank you for being part of my audience. You can also find links to videos or podcasts on MiamiGhostChronicles.com, as well as where you can submit your story about any eerie experiences you've had, which I would love to hear about. Just go to the Submit Your Story tab. Please subscribe to our channel so that you receive notification of when we release a new show. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where I usually live stream and where I give you a behind-the-scenes look at locations where new episodes are being filmed at. I also tell you about all the interesting guests that will be appearing soon on Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you enjoy the show, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, it's Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicle Stories of the Supernatural. How is everybody doing today? Uh, today, today I am super thrilled with a guest that I have, and I know you guys are going to be thrilled too, absolutely, because um, this is somebody that's, uh, like I say, has a foot in both worlds, kind of the world of the paranormal, but also in the world of hard facts, and this gentleman's name is Greg Lawson, and uh, Greg has spent much of his adult life exploring strange places, uh, from the first Russian colony in Three Saints Bay, Alaska, to the pyramids of Egypt. He's also explored several paranormal hotspots in over 40 countries. So we're going to be asking him about that, absolutely. He is a career law enforcement officer with uh, over 26 years of experience, and he also served 10 years in various branches of the military. He's worked as a mental health investigator and as a child abuse, sex crimes, and homicide detective. So that's that's the part about the hard facts. Uh, he has a master's degree in education from Texas State University where he concentrated his studies in complex adaptive human systems. And he also specializes in investigative procedures and teaches these skills to Texas law enforcement officers. He's an international lecturer and the author of two fictional novels, The Disorient Express, I like that title, and The Carry-On, and one satirical horror manual titled Zombie Advocacy. His newest book is Detecting Paranormal, an Advanced Guide to Paranormal Research and Evaluation. So, how are you doing today, Greg? I'm doing well. I think I need to shorten that bio a little now, bit. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Leave that exactly where it's at. Leave that exactly where it's at. You know, yeah. this is the truth. This is, you know, this is what you've done and... Uh, what your background is, and this just gives people a little bit of an idea of flavor of right. where you come from, where you spring from. And um, and I'm going to ask you what I ask all my guests, which is obviously, uh, like I said, you ha it seems like you had a foot in both worlds. You had uh, the paranormal maybe because of, I don't and that's what I'm going to ask you, personal experiences, maybe as a kid, but then you had to deal with also with hard facts uh, with, right. because of the type of work that you do. So, what did you ever have any uh, experiences as a child? Well, yeah, as a very young child, uh, I was about five and I was at home. Obviously, it was in the evening time and I was watching one of the three channels on TV at that point. Yeah, yeah well, there were and, just three channels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Frankenstein, the original movie was coming on. Okay. And I wanted to watch Frankenstein. My mother, of course, said I couldn't watch Frankenstein. And I, of course, then turned and being the uh, the youngest uh, of four kids uh, through a temper tantrum and cried on the floor and stuff. And, of course, got my way. My mother said, OK, so you want to watch Frankenstein? OK. And so she went and got some Jiffy Pop popcorn and a little, um, I don't know, some sort of orange drink, I think it was. Uh -huh. And I sat there and I watched Frankenstein. And that, that messed me up. Uh, for years, yeah, really, and yeah, and it, so it's she really gave you what is like here you are, okay, <laughs> yeah. That night, I had this dream, and and now um, I, I say this in jest, but I'm a recovering Catholic. Oh, so man. when, I, when, when I was, yeah, when I was growing up, uh, that was one of the. I mean, that that's what my foundation was built in was the Holy Ghost and the you know and just everything that has to do with 
being Catholic. And so my godmother had given me a, uh, uh, a sacred heart picture of Jesus, okay. which is, which looks like Ted Nugent with his heart getting ripped out, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, great. yeah. And it scared the hell out of me. You know, I would sit there and look at that thing in my room and his eyes would follow me and everything. And it was just creepy. Right. Well, that night I had had a dream and I uh, had a dream that the blonde lady was coming to get me. And I don't know what that means, but I was terrified. And uh, and that that was my first triggering mechanism of the paranormal. And when I lived in that house, it backed up to a military base. Okay. And. I had had experiences as a child that I had to go to the restroom and I was walking down the hallway and I had to go through a little sitting area to get to the restroom and these hands were coming out from under the bed and grabbing me. Oh God. Yeah. And so I, I, I remember that as vividly as I remember, you know, petting my dog when I came home. Uh, and I don't know whether it's something that, you know, I just dwelt on that it was a, uh, I still say dwelt, dwelt, yes. dwelt. Yeah. Don't it, it, believe I don't me. I, yeah, that, that, I would dwell, dwelt whatever on it if I would have seen <laughs> something like that. Believe me. I'm just I'm making stuff up. Uh, you know, words apparently. So it, that was one of the the founding things that really got me interested in the paranormal. Okay. And uh, and, and uh, about a year later, um, I swear to this day, I saw a thunderbird. Now, I could have been a really big buzzard, but um, I was I was up the street, okay. and um, this bird came down over me, and was you know was swooping down pretty fast, and came right over my head, and uh, it was it was as wide as the street was, so oh. and and I really that that was not a dream there that that was something that happened and and whether or not I. You know, maybe my perspective as a child, as it was coming in fast or something, you know, it, it you know, this is the adult in me talking, saying, well, right. that doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. And, uh, and of course, my brother torturing me, taking me through graveyards and stuff when I was seven or eight. <laughs> you <Oops>. know. <laughs> you were the baby my... of the family, so, yeah. You know, that's, that's right. Like... That's right. Yeah, my brother used to um, pick me up. He was 17 when I was five, and okay. he had a motorcycle, and he would pick me up and sit me on the gas tank of the motorcycle. We'd, we'd go, and uh, he would go look for old graveyards. We'd go to old graveyards, and then we'd walk around and look at the tombstones and stuff. And then, of course, what's that? What's right. that over there? I can imagine. Yeah, he start, must have been yeah. like, okay. But I bet you every uh, time yeah. he wanted to go, you'd be there right there because, of course, yeah. you had your big brother uh, to take care of you. Yep, yeah, that's right. That's right. Those, you know, I, I think – and it's really funny because I think sometimes the, the there's a lost art of getting scared where people, kids, you know, or you would get scared of simple stuff like that. A scary movie like Frankenstein or going through the graveyard. Right. It was, but it was a good thrill, you know. It wasn't like nowadays. I think some of the movies get a little bit too graphic as far as the scare, the scare or what they call the wow factor. So Yeah, they, they have completely desensitized people. Um, they, they have, I'm, they have. I, I, I and before when, they left more to your imagination and now it's like right i remember when uh, the exorcist came out oh my god and how you know it was all over the newspaper it was front page news in austin texas you know that the the craziness of of the exorcist and my wife and i about oh, i guess it's been about 10 or 15 years they did a re-release you know mm-hmm. digitally mastered and, and did a re-release Directors of the exorcist or something like that yeah yeah and it was out in the, in the movie theaters and so I told Lynn, I, hey, let's go, let's go see this. And so we went and saw it and it was nothing but jeering and cat calling and people laughing. And, you know, just, it was incredible. The, the desensitization of the public through, uh, you know, you know, Michael Myers and, and oh, uh, yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street and Jason and everybody else. It's, uh, right. It, and, and it's like, and I remember, oh, well, when that movie came out, I remember they were continuously running different stories about, you know, churches being overrun. I mean, with the priests, like people yeah. saying, I'm possessed and other people f- f- running out of the theater. I mean, people were like wigged out totally with this they movie were. when it came out. Yeah. I mean, really wigged out. Even adults. It wasn't even just teenagers, full grown adults. 
Uh, yeah. We're having a hard time with that movie. People people were throwing up in the uh, in the movie theater when she threw up the pea soup, you know. I know, and now they, it's like people was, are like, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> yeah, now nowadays people are just like, I've seen everything. I've been – people have been exposed – since they were children now, you know, from, from like the, maybe the eighties on forward, maybe a little seventies. Uh, but they, they've been exposed to just absolutely horrific images and, yeah. uh, and it desensitizes you. It does. Right. No, I, I, I remember when I was growing up, yeah, you know, they had all what I call the B slasher movies, oh, yeah. but they were like, you know, like they were kind of like, you know, the blood kind of, but nowadays the slash, I'm going to, I don't even watch slasher movies. Yeah. I don't, at this point, it's like, it's too graphic. It's too real. It's like, right. I, I, I just don't see the entertainment in the, it. And like you said, the movie's this is like not hostile. Movie. Oh, yeah. It's like, I never saw that movie. It's like, I, why would I put myself like, and because it's too real, and I could tell myself all night long, it's just a movie. It's just a movie, but it's so realistic. I just don't right. see the entertainment in seeing a human being being tortured, and you know, it's like, yeah. okay. Oh. No, no, you know the sadists out there—they can go go run and watch this movie, <laughs> you know. But no, I um, I I I always liked it. Like I said, yeah, there's been scary movies and slasher movies, but they were so cheesy, for lack of a better right. word. It was like you knew. It was like okay, you had your little thrill, your moment, like oh, and then that was it. It's like it wasn't real, and you could tell it wasn't real. But nowadays, and and in the and this is the thing, you know, with all jumping the shark, you're always wondering what's what are they gonna do to top that. Because like right. you said, your audience, the audiences nowadays are a little bit more uh, jaded. <laughs> you know, yes, it's... for sure. Yeah. So, so here, fast forward, you grow up and did you ever have as a teenager, adolescent, any other experiences or what happened after that? So I did, you know, all through junior high, uh, I did urban exploring and, and, uh, yeah, I guess rural explore, exploring and old farms and, and, uh, the area that I grew up in around Rockdale, Texas, um, had a lot of Spanish occupation in the 1700s there. Okay. There's a, obviously a lot of Indian o- occupation also. So there's a lot of history there. And so my friends and I would, would go and hunt graveyards there and go look for the, the old Spanish missions out in the woods mm-hmm. and swim in the river and all that. So the only things that I can really nail down, I guess, of uh, what I would consider experiences were more along the metaphys- metaphysical line of experiences, more along of an emotional feeling um, type experience as opposed to actually seeing something or actually hearing something that I could not, um, you know, identify. Yes. So, so, and, and, and that's kind of what I did. And, and, and when I left Rockdale and I joined the military, I went into the army and I, I got to be assigned up in Alaska and I was uh, down in central America and I was over in the North Africa and the middle East. Right. And, you know, every time we had Liberty, we, we got some sort of leave and R and R. I was way away from the soldiers and I was way embedded into whatever the weirdness was in that area. So I, I would kind of try to do my research. And, you know, back then we didn't have the Internet, so you had to go to the library, and which is not a cool place to hang out. But, you know, yeah. um, that, that's where I would learn a lot of my stuff is out of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, what's what's the weird kind of stuff going on? Right. And so, so I would follow up with that. And then it, you know, with the internet and everything else, it's just, uh, it's snowballed at this point. So right. because people don't realize that there, the internet was not around. There was such a thing as an encyclopedia, which was, <laughs> they would put out right. an update once a year. Wow. Yeah. We were, we were in Transylvania. I went to a uh, pulmonary castle. Um, wow. that's Vlad the Impaler, Dracula's, mm-hmm. uh, bat, battle castle. And uh, so we went there with a bunch of friends, and we're we're up there, and um, uh, you know it was just amazing. And you're looking over the valley, and you're you're imagining all this stuff, and you know, and his wife, they had told his wife incorrectly that he was slain in battle in one of the battles, and so uh, she went and threw herself from the wall okay. and committed suicide, and he wasn't dead at all. He uh, he he had survived the battle. And he returned back to celebrate with his his wife, and who was, you know, 
dead at that point. But the interesting thing is, is, is me as a, I, I, I call myself, uh, a, you know, a paranormal detective. Okay. Uh, but I look at the things, and in that case, she, the, the legend is she threw herself from the wall into the river. Okay. Well, she would have had to have turned into a bat and flown over there because it's about a quarter mile away. He's like, so, yeah, all right. The, the river didn't move that much. No, it didn't move that much. So, uh, and it's way up on a mountain. I mean, it's 1,480 steps just to get up there. Wow. And and so we go up there and we're, we're looking around and, you know, they have some uh, people on spikes, you know, out there as far as impaled, you know, that's right. just kind of, uh, uh, you know, a little Hollywood stuff going on. And we all kind of gathered in this one area and, and the walls are all busted down and it's um, some of the towers are still in place, but uh, the tops of them are all busted off. There's no roofs or anything. And we're in the back of what would be the castle in, in some sort of great room. I don't know what it was, but it was a big area and it's kind of sloped because dirt and, and things have kind of filled in that area. Okay. And there's about, I don't know, 15, 20 of us sitting there. And as we're waiting, there, there's we were there with a guy named Dave Schrader. I don't know if you've ever heard yes, of him. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're there with Dave. And Dave is sitting over there. And about that time, it's a beautiful day. And about that time, a wind came up, which is not unusual. Here's a wind. No, it increased. It had increased and then created a dust devil Okay. right there in the middle of all of us, right? And it was getting big. I mean, this thing's like 20 feet. I mean, it's a big dust devil. This is 60 mile an hour wind probably or more. And I'm standing there. Yeah, I'm standing there freaking <laughs> out. I'm going, finally, I got, I got to Transylvania and Vlad knows I'm here. You know, look at this. <laughs> That's what it looks like. He's, he's sending us a signal, you know, and about that time, Dave Schrader stands up throws his arm out, out to the side, walks into this dust devil and starts screaming, I shall smite thee with oh. my vengeance. And everything. I'm like, you're like, wait. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I was going to have a paranormal experience and you just ruined it. Yeah, you know? like, this, is, this like, doesn't yeah, happen all the time. Devil. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's, yeah, it's, uh, it's true. It's, it's it's a lot of people go to these places, and it's kind of like okay, historically, it's like oh, interesting, but that's about it. Yeah, he just completely sucked the life out of my, you know, your moment, my thoughts. Yeah, I was like, wow, really. So anyway, that's you know, you know, but but, uh, but this is the thing. A lot of, I mean, I think nowadays, if you go around there, I know that they 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 make, and I don't blame them. You know, they have built like a tourist kind of industry about, around it. You know, money wise. But yeah. people don't realize that in that part of Europe, especially, they do. And for hundreds of years, they did believe truly in vampires. It wasn't like. Oh, yeah. You know. Actually, there, there's there's small groups of people that still believe in them. Yeah. And the funny thing is, is, is Vlad, Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, you know, mm -hmm. Drac Dracula, whatever you want to call him, is uh, vilified in the United States. Right. He's a hero in yeah. Romania. Yeah. He, he is he, like. He repelled uh, the Turks. Sure. Yeah, he's like George Washington, not yes. quite George Washington, but I mean, he he was he's that well liked and yeah. everybody. It's like, yeah, he he wouldn't have been violent if he'd just stay out of his backyard. You know, all you got to well, do is, if you're from another country, don't invade my country. Otherwise, well, it, I'm going to kill you. You know, and a lot of people, you know? Uh, you know, warfare being what it was, but especially back then, which was pretty savage. But part of what uh, I heard was that. He was also trying to do like a psychological warfare against the Turks being that savage because it was sure. like, yeah. I'm going to make you so scared that I'm willing to do this, even though, you know, life was. That's exactly anything. right. Yeah. But yeah, it's people. It's incredible what people. But I, I've heard of what they call in that part, you know, Poland and also in Transylvania, Romania. Uh, what they call those deviant burials. I mean, in other words, everybody always thinks of Dracula as being Count Dracula or the Prince Vlad, but they've had they found what they call deviant burials where really older cemeteries four or five hundred years ago, they've opened them up, some of them, and they find some of them with certain things like across their neck or on their hips, which oh, yeah. is the equivalent of pinning the corpse to inside their 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 coffin. Right. And they believe that th this were, these were people that the community thought were either vampires or they were afraid that they were going to rise from the dead. So there yep. is absolutely a belief in that around that area.
Yeah. Even yeah. though we think of it like, who's going to believe that? It's like, yeah. Well, you know, when, when you've never been to school and you don't know how to read and the only thing that uh, you believe in is what your parents tell you, what your priest tells you and what your community shares with you. Other than that, yeah, you yes. know, it's, it's kind of hard to, to base something in what would be considered fact when you, you don't have any, you know, method to, uh, then, to it, logically but, work it out. But you know what the good part about this, and I'm sure that you as a writer of fiction always thinks okay that's the logical explanation but what is there is truly which is like what Bram Stoker kind of did like is there really sure. any truth to all these folklore you know like yeah and that and then we go down that you know the the uh it's not folklore in the end you're right but we um, were we were in Whitby uh England uh I guess a year ago or thereabouts and uh there, there's a bench that overlooks the sea there, and that's where Bram Stoker sat and imagined. You know, when the uh, the Demeter ship uh, ran yes. aground, that's uh -huh. where he he imagined. So I'm sitting there looking at all that and remembering that the passage, and and you know, it's like wow, <laughs> yes. it was it was just an incredible place. Yeah, it's one I, of my favorite get places. That moment on. of inspiration that turns into that. I don't know. I don't know what you want to call it. Their muse, whatever. Where, because I've read, I've read some of his other um, short stories, and they're pretty good. But let's face it, Dracula is Dracula, and of course, yeah, you know, so many things have sprung from that. <laughs> Even Twilight. <laughs> I know. Oh my god. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying is like it's so it's so different, but at the same time, really, its roots are uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so when you're going up, so you're doing all these travels, and did you ever have any experience when you were going through these countries or some of these places, maybe if especially if they were really ancient? So the, the most um, stark experience I guess I had was – I was in Alaska. I was in Kodiak, Alaska, going through a pararescue class. Okay. And so we, we spent about three weeks uh, in the water there in Alaskan water, which is about 32 degrees, 33 degrees, you know, right above freezing. Yes. Um, but so we're swimming and doing all this stuff. And we, we I go through the school and then I have um, that was on a, I got out of there on a Friday and I had to be back uh, at Fort Richardson on Monday. Okay. And I had like $210 with me or something. I don't know what it was. And so I decided that I wanted to go to Three Saints Bay and their, um, the, the first Russian colony there. And the only way to get there is to get a uh, Alaskan Uber, which is, you know, you just go to the, the, the closest airport and find the least drunk individual there oh and uh, to, to fly you someplace. So yeah. Reassuring. Yeah. It's beautiful. And so, uh, you know, I paid this guy like $25 or something to fly me from there to, um, uh, uh, old Harbor which is where they moved Three Saints Bay, Alaska, when the typhoon, there, there was a, a, a tsunami that came in and, and destroyed the town in, in the 1700s. Okay. And so they, they relocated it to a safer anchorage. And so I flew in there and it was really weird because when I got out off the plane, I had to, about a quarter mile to walk into town and I'm walking along and, you know, you imagine Alaska, it's you know, these big tall trees and beautiful water and you're walking through the woods and you come around the corner and there's a giant blue dome and it's a Russian Orthodox church sitting there. Wow. From, from the 1700s. Yeah. It's just crazy. Uh, it completely out of, you know, it what, what didn't go with the landscape. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I go there and um, I had read about uh, a massacre that happened to the elite people up there. Um, the Russians had the, the, the Eskimo and the elite didn't understand, uh, you know, gunfire. And so they they fought one type of warfare and the Russians fought a different type of warfare. And the Russians would come in and kill everybody or take them as slaves and, and that sort of thing. And so this uh, big village went out to a place called Refuge Rock, and it's about 300 yards off the coast. And they went there to – that's where they would go whenever they were, uh, you know, under fire. But they didn't understand cannon, so 
the Russians lined up boats on either side and just killed all of them or a majority of them. Now, anywhere from 300 to 3,000. Um, there, there's uh, some pretty good accounts of uh, some uh, anthropologists that went through there in the early 1800s and took some accounts of what happened. So I talked this fisherman into taking me across to an island called Sikaladak Island, and I got off there, and I could see Refuge Rock from there. It's like I said, it was about 300 yards off. Um, and I really can't uh, logically explain what happened after that because I, I got to spend about eight hours out there. And they wanted me on that rock, and that's all I can tell you. Um, I, I can't explain my experience other than I knew I was supposed to be there. Okay. And it was profound. It really was. And, and while I'm sitting there, I decided I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can swim out there. I oh, know uh, I didn't have, I, I, yeah, I had a dry suit on when I was in, uh, you know, going, going through the school. Uh, but I was thinking, you know, I, I, I think I can do this. And of course you and I both know there's no way I could have done that. Uh, and so I'm looking at it, and there's like a little land bridge that goes out there. It's about three or four feet underwater. Okay. And I don't know whether it, – it almost looks like to me that the the Native Americans there actually built that so that, you know, it would be submerged, but you could actually, right. you know, go out there on maybe low tide or something. And so I made it, uh, I don't know, about maybe 70 yards into the water and I started thinking about how cold it was. And I started thinking about uh, the other animals that are in the water out there. And I'm all by myself. This wasn't really smart. And so I failed in my quest. I, I uh, didn't have the courage to go ahead and go on out there. And, and I just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Um, other than, you know, you see those movies and, you know, some spirit or something controls somebody and makes them do something really stupid. I was about to say, I mean, yeah, it makes, it, was, it, it sounds almost like for a moment there, you kind of like lost your, you know, when somebody like, it's like, oh, yeah. I've got to be there. I've got to go there. And it's like, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was like that. But like I said, I really can't, uh, explain it better than that, but and I'm going to go ever back do there more one research day. on this place. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, they've actually um, they've made it a national uh, refuge now. You're not allowed to go on the. I mean, there's the, from the 1805 account of a Dutch explorer that went through there. He interviewed some of the people that survived that, and the 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 mothers were taking their children and throwing throwing them off the cliff so that the Russians couldn't take them as slaves. Oh my God. Yeah, it's just, you know, there's there's bodies all over that place. I can imagine. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'd, I'm going to go back there one day, though. I am. That sounds, that's, I had not heard of this place. I had not heard of this place. And see, that's yeah. what I like. I like to go or hear about places like this, which have this history, but are not like everybody and their second cousin have, you know, you hear about it. It's like, okay. You know, because you kind of get like a regurgitated history that some, a lot of times is not really accurate. But this sounds right. like a really and, interesting place. And I, I've had a lot of, you know, some of my editors and stuff are like, well, why don't you write something mainstream? Like, what, write, uh, uh, write something about uh, Amityville or, you know, the, um, I don't know, Lizzie Borden or, yeah. you know, something like that. And it's like. They've already done all that. You know, right. there, there are stories out there. There are personal So I was in a graveyard today. I was I was driving along and there was a graveyard I've, I've wanted to look at. And I thought, well, I'm going to take my lunch break and, and I'll, I'll go over there. And it's it's Roberts Hill. And it is literally in a it's it's all undergrowth and and trees. OK, it's not cleared out at all. Um, there are tombstones scattered everywhere. It's it's um, it, it was pretty amazing. Anyway, so the reason I wanted to go out there is there's a couple of Texas Rangers that are that are buried out there. Okay. And I wanted to go see if I could find them, and they were real easy to find. But really? literally, I mean, I, I it, you you could barely see. You had to push your way into the to the cemetery. Uh, it hasn't been taken care of for I, I would guess thirty or forty. years. Mm -hmm. maybe it's, it's just completely overgrown yeah. but it was pretty pretty fascinating and um, so you know I, 
there are stories there. You know, there, there are stories about those Texas Rangers. There's, uh, you know, right across from there is a, uh, the old Platt farm, which those people, they went through horrific things. And there was there was a, a, a guy named uh, um, Wilbarger, Josiah Wilbarger, got scalped. And um, uh, the guys that were with him got killed. A couple of them got away. And when the guys came back to the platform, they told them what happened. They're like, all right, well, he's dead. We'll go see if we can find his body in the morning. That night, his wife woke up and said, no, Josiah is, is, um, is awake. He's alive. You need to go get him. And they're like, no, he's not. Go back to sleep, woman. And so they get an argument and, and they go back to sleep and she wakes up again because she keeps getting this vision, right? Okay. So in the meantime, Josiah is naked. He only has one sock on. He's stuck full of arrows and he doesn't have any hair. He's got his, oh he's been God. scalped. Yeah. And he's crawling along and it's, it's night at this point. And his sister walks up to him and says, Josiah, you're hurt very badly. Stay here. I'm going to get help. And he says, okay. So he stays there and he leans up against this tree that's there and she disappears off into the night. Well, once the, um, uh, uh, Miss Hornsby, Sarah Hornsby, uh, she's the one that's having this vision. She wakes up her husband says, you have to go get him. He is alive. I'm telling you. So they get on their horses. They go out and sure enough, find him there. Wow. They pick him up, take him home, and he lives like another 11, 12 years, something like that, with no skin on the top of his head. Yeah. Oh, my God. So the, the crazy part is, is when he gets back and they nurse him back to health, he writes his, his, uh, his sister because she lives in St. Louis. And come to find out that she, was, uh, she died the day before oh, this what? all happened. Yeah. And and so it's it's as a detective for me, it's really cool to hear a legend, and yes. then to actually get the uh, the letters from the family or be be oh, able, to able to look to at the that? letters. Yeah, wow. yeah, look at the letters from the family where, you know, uh, Miss Hornsby was writing. This is what happened, you know. Right. And then you, you you put the puzzle all back together, and you're like, wow, you know, is it? And as a homicide detective, there's this uh, saying that there's no such thing as a coincidence. Exactly. And so, and so you know, I, I try not to, um, like I say, go too far outside of a realm of logic or, or, or what I consider scientific materialism. I try to try to figure out the causation of whatever it is. Right. But you know, stuff like this, you just sit back it's and go, like, you know, there's no way that he could have. I mean, it's like. And it's incredible because yeah. he was, you know, you could say, well, he was delirious and he thought he saw his yeah. sister for whatever yeah, reason it was in St. Yeah. Louis, but she's dead. And yeah. And then he has this other person who's convinced that he's alive. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, uh, there are so many intriguing stories like that everywhere. Yes. And, you know, most people gravitate to the fantastical, you know, the, you know, the, or the, or the really popular, like I said, the Amityville kind of thing. Uh, when, man, next door, you know, there, there was, yes. from where I live, a hundred yards from me, there's a, a Tonkawa graveyard, a, an Indian graveyard yes. that nobody knows about. Well, I take that back. The parks department in Georgetown knows exactly. about it, but nobody else um, really pays any attention to it. Yes, and people they, don't they just realize keep... that. And and you know, and I and um, I tell people, you know, because especially if if you grow up in an urban area, and of course by the time, you know, you've got your established cemeteries. But I say a lot of times, when when towns or cities or wherever, when they were growing up. Sometimes uh, they would have what I called unofficial graveyards where, uh, especially if they had workers or transients or people that they didn't know what to do with, they would just say, yeah, over in that corner, yeah, right. bury, bury them there. And then people forgot, you know, that there's basically like a small graveyard, you know, in a certain area because they were they didn't have any – nobody was going to spend money to even put up a marker. And if there was, it That's was made right. of wood, which – you know, within a few years is gone. Well, in, in this area that I was in today, uh, a, a huge area 
had no markers at all, but depressions where all the graves were. Yeah. And it was, it was amazing, but I'm going to go back to that place and, and do some more research on it. It's just absolutely amazing graveyard. It's took a lot of pictures. I have, we, I had one, I did one, um, not too far from where I live at. And what happened was this was around right after the turn of the century here in South Florida. And, um, the way it worked was, you know, back then they had segregation even for cemeteries and there was a lumber company and they, they had workers, African-American workers, and they didn't have a place to bury their dead. So the owners of the company asked Masons, the Ma a Masonic lodge who had a piece of land, if they would allow them to do that. And they did. And they used it from like 1919 to like 1955. And then after that, you know, it fell out of disuse, whatever. But now if you go there, all you have are the plots. In other words, most people do not know that the cemetery is there. Right. And about the only, there's only like two markers, which were for two veterans from World War One, And of, cur of course, they were made, very well made uh, markers. And that's why they were there. And a couple more. But there's a slew of people buried there and... And maybe some you'll see, like you said, you know, where the earth falls in and you've got like that indentation, but that's it. Right. But yeah. there's no official entrance that it's a cemetery or anything like that. Nothing at all. This Roberts Hill Cemetery in Austin uh, has a bunch of people that fought in the revolutionary, I mean, not the revolution, the uh, um, when Texas uh, seceded and from Mexico and, 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 there's a lot of those graves there. There's a lot of World War One, uh, like just what you said. You know, I mean, I'm I can't explain it. It's like in a jungle. I mean, this is really yes. grown over. And there's these beautiful tombstones, mm -hmm. you know, that are military, you know, veteran tombstones. It says what unit they they were in, and you know, it was it's pretty. Pretty amazing. Yeah, no, but, I, I, these two, the, the two veterans that were, I, I found their records, their their records. As a matter of fact, they had served in France, and they served in, a, in a, I guess, in a division, I hope I'm using the right word, of civil engineers, which were, like, equivalent to, like, firefighters. And both of them had gone off and fought in World War One in France. And, you know, I was able to locate their records, of course, because it's military records. Uh, but otherwise, most of the people that are buried there, that's it. And that's what happens. Family members move away. They die themselves yeah. and that's it. Yeah. So there's a lot of those, a lot of those around a lot of history, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you real quick because especially because of the work that you do with, with police work and Amityville, the one thing I always ask myself is why didn't anybody hear those shots? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, you know that's I, the I'm, one I'm, thing of of the whole story, and I know that there's been a lot of versions. And I'm I'm talking pre um, the horror part, you know, the supernatural. Yeah, the luxes. Yeah, the, uh, the, the actual luxes, yeah. Uh, crime. Yeah, where I can't, and the reason why I say this that there was um, I want to say was it in the seventies. They had one they called the Easter Sunday Sling, which was a, a guy, one of these family annihilators. That he wiped out his mom, his brother, his uh, his sister-in-law, and all their kids. Like, he slew everybody. On a Sunday during the day. It was Easter Sunday. And the police showed up because, like, two hours later, he called them. And he lived in, like, in a, in a suburban residential area. And I was like, what is this? I can't believe that nobody was thinking, is, are those multiple shots? What is that? Right. I, that's one of those, I want to say borderline supernatural things that it's like, what happens to the noise of when this violence has taken place? Yeah, yeah inside the house, um, it's going to be muffled pretty good, but you're still going to hear it outside. And unless you, you know, muffle it also with a pillow, you know, right. that, that'll take up some of it. And then most people, you know, they hear a couple of things and they, they just don't think anything of right, it. I don't know. Right. And that's usually because, I mean, we do it, you know, you hear something and you're like, was that a shot? You know, but you th you think of all the other things it could be. But then I'm thinking, okay, when you have the these multiple shots, like if, if for example, that guy, he killed like 10 people and what's his face to fail, killed what his whole family, like six, six, seven. 
in in the middle of the night and i was like doesn't anybody think after the second or third shot it's like wait a minute you know what that sounds like a shot you know to me that there's right. something there like okay it, it it's very weird and unusual sometimes where uh things like this they just you would think nobody's paying attention or I don't know, just even out of curiosity. Because I'm thinking, where is that nosy neighbor that everybody has on their block? You know, <laughs> that person that's always looking around and making sure who's doing that what. And I guess it didn't exist on those in those neighborhoods. So, yeah, and, and, and neighbors solve crimes. <laughs> I, I can yeah. I can promise you that that's that's who solves crimes. You know, the cops show up. Um, and, and they do interviews and stuff like that, but it's the neighbors that are paying attention that step forward and, and, uh, and solve these things. But, you yeah, know, a lot of people don't want to get involved. And uh, I mean, I, I'm always thinking because, I mean, you know, I, I, I agree, you know, you stay out of each other's business as far as neighbors are concerned. But at the same time, you always think if I really see something unusual or hear something weird, I'm going to look and see what's going on because, you, you know, even for my own personal safety, even if, let's say, if you want to, you know, but I guess it has to do a lot with what's going on and or or what people expect to hear. You know, I guess most people yeah. don't think that their neighbors are getting massacred inside their house. Right. So they don't go. You're there. hoping they're not. No, no, no. Or, yeah, you know, it, it's I think it's a it's a it's a bunch of different circumstances that contribute to that. Um. So and when you went into and this is the thing when you went into police work and i know that especially if you imagine if you did homicide that you go to i guess you have to put on your objective it's just the facts ma'am kind of hat on but have you ever had any weird experiences or seen anything at any of these scenes so probably the the weirdest one um, was not a it was not a homicide. It was when I was working as a mental health officer. OK, but I, I, I found it interesting um, because 20 years later or so, I talked to a a medium and she told me some things. And I was like, that's pretty amazing. OK, but um, so what happened was, is I, I was um, uh, what's called a CIT officer. It's a critical incident. Okay. team and I was a negotiator hostage negotiator suicide mediator okay and so I get called this woman has her baby and she's holding it over a, a balcony and oh. on the third floor of this apartment complex oh. and she's got postpartum depression she's just lost it man she's just what? completely lost it and so the uniformed officers are all there and she's threatening, you know, screaming and holding this baby oh. over and you know so there's guys below her trying to figure out how to catch her and catch the kid with a sheet and all this stuff. So I pull up and I get out and I'm in plain clothes and I, I walk up and I, it's, it's, you know, like on the third floor. So it's got these switchback stairs going okay. all the way up there and they're open on the side of the apartment complex. So as I get to the second floor, uh, she sees me out of the corner of her eye and she looks at me and I, I'm walking up and I get to the third floor and she takes the baby uh, over the railing back to her okay and embraces the baby turns and walks and I walk into the front door and to the sliding glass door where the uniformed officer was okay and she sticks her baby out and just hands it to me and I take the baby and I turn to the uniform officer and I give it to him and I'm going take her down you know and I, I turned around to this woman and she gave me a big hug and everything and so we hugged and we walked down and I went and put her in the back of my car and took her straight to the state hospital. Right. And no, no, no conversation at all. I didn't ask her what her name was. I didn't do anything. Okay. And, and it was just a, a very odd thing. So I, I put her in the state hospital, put her on a, uh, um, a, a 72 hour hold or whatever it was called. Okay. Then. And so a couple of maybe a month and a half, two months later, I was up in the state hospital and I had to go through one of the wards to uh, interview an escapee. Okay. And as I'm walking through the ward, there she is and she stands up and she starts crying and kind of laughing at the same time. Oh my God. Oh my God. You're here. And she comes and gives me a big hug again. And she says, you're an angel. You're an angel. And she's looking at me and she's looking at my back and she's like looking around. I'm like, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? I'm, she goes, you were an angel. You had a halo. You had 
you had huge wings. I knew you were there to save me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really cool. It was a really cool thing. So you finally um, figured out why she just like was so docile. Yeah, I I had no clue of what was going on. I was just flowing with it, man. You know, that's one of the biggest mistakes cops make is they ask too many damn questions and they won't shut up. (laughs) They'll keep talking (laughs) because they know everything, you know. And so the if she ended up saying there, I guess it sounds like they committed her. Oh yeah, yeah. She was she was in the state hospital on medication for a long time. Okay. But um, but so uh, a few years later, I'm I'm doing a book signing with Fiona Broom. Have you ever heard of her? Yes. Okay, she's awesome. I love Fiona, and uh, and she's she's written what the uh, Ghost of Austin, the Ghost of Boston, the Ghost of Seattle, like you know all these uh-huh. different really cool. Really, I actually use her book as one of my reference guides for. Uh, a lot of the investigations that I do around here. Anyway, I was doing a, a book signing with her and um, she goes, so um, I, I said something like, you know, I haven't had that vision. I haven't had that, you know, that experience. And she looks at me, she goes, you're not going to. And I said, well, you know, why? And she goes, have you ever seen your aura? You have wings. You have you have a huge. Wow. And I'm just looking at her, going, "Really? Okay, that's awful convenient." Now, <laughs> well, you so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get to see anything because ghosts don't like me. That's what uh, that's what she said, and I've had I've had one other medium say the same thing. That is incredible. So yeah, she was like, "You need to look at your or you need to look at your aura. You need to get an aura picture. You need to do this." And I did, that's and I, I didn't, you know. I, you know Just what? As blob, long as it's blob. if it's a positive thing, it's like yeah, perfect. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with it, whatever you know. Absolutely. And that's one of those things about the paranormal is people will say, "Well, I can't believe you believe in that." Okay, well, what did you talk to your priest about last time? So give me give me the scientific materialism right. of that of where the evidence is on this one. And of course, I can point out everything: the flowers, you know, this an eyeball, obviously, you know. Yes. Um, it's so complex that something would have to create it. It just couldn't grow out of the muck, which I believe. I, 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 I should say I don't believe that we grew out of the muck. They might have used the muck to make us, exactly. um, but something else happened. There's there's something pretty miraculous that that's happened. Absolutely, I, I believe so. so. I, I, you know, whether you know you, whether you want to call it uh create you know in- intelligent creation i mean if you don't want to go just with a straight evolution or with the straight bible version you know adam and eve kind of thing uh i do think that there's some intelligence and intention behind us and then you know you'll get the ufologist who say yeah we were we were hybridized from alien genomes or whatever but yeah, yeah. you know even then where do they come from if, if you want to go with that theory absolutely right. and Usually people that are in this field, I say, you know, if especially if sensationalism is great, but let's say you're not, once you have that firsthand experience that you really can't account for and you're not ready to jump to that conclusion immediately, there's a paradigm or reality shift that you think, you know, if nobody ever believes me, I don't care because I know what I experienced. Right. And and that's something that I, you know, people have asked me, have you ever used a medium or, you know, a sensitive or, or, you know, a clairvoyant in any of your investigations? And I say, yeah, I've, I've used them several times. Um, and the real answer to that, because you, you'll have, you know, detectives that will roll their eyes and go, oh, my God, this guy do not know what he's doing. Right. Well, you know, when you go to a when you have a case and you've interviewed all the witnesses, you've collected all the evidence that you can, and you've uh, you know looked at your suspects, and you just don't have anything. Right. You know, there, there's just nowhere to go. I can't get an indictment on this case. Mm-hmm. What is it going to hurt to ring to somebody up and go, hey, man, <laughs> right. this is what I'm, I'm, I'm working on a case right now, and I wanted to take you over to this location and just let you walk around and see what you see what you think. Especially uh, maybe, imagine yeah. if it's something like a stranger, you know, like stranger, like that, that maybe it's not, I want to say the usual suspects, you know, the neighbor, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, whatever. What right. if it's a stranger that you have no yep. idea to look at? So I've done that and 
the the whole key to that is is to you know make sure that you don't give up any information to the medium Mm -hmm. but also you have to trust the medium enough that they didn't look in the newspaper and start looking stuff up on the internet because I'm sorry, folks. There are people out there that will screw yes. you over and take your money. Yes. Absolutely. And it's really easy to do. I had a, a cop that came up to me and told me about this experience that he had going to see a medium. He had had a critical incident 25 years ago that has affected his whole life. And he went to this medium and told me this miraculous stuff that she told him. And he goes, there, and there's no way she would know this. And And so he's sitting on one side of the desk. I'm sitting on the other with my laptop and I'm just typing in keywords that he he was like, okay, so what did she know about you? Well, she knew that my name was, you know, this and that I worked at this location. And I I typed that in and the the, um, newspaper article popped right up of what happened. And he goes through this entire story of how miraculous that this woman is just incredible and everything. And it's just her, her precision was, was spot on, right? She read the article. Of course. And I was, I was leading to saying this, and I was going to turn my laptop around and show him. <laughs> you know, hey, look, you, you told me these three things. I typed it in, and look, guess what the first, first thing that pops up on Google is? Yeah. But I, could I didn't be do it. right now. That's <laughs> yeah. as good as her. I, I, I didn't do it. He, he was so at peace of what she told him. Right. And he was so amazed. I'm like, man, I'm not going to take that away from him. I'm not going to get into an argument with him. And I'm glad, you know, I, it would be like me getting into an argument because your priest gave you some advice and told you some things and it made you feel better. What difference does it make whether it's a medium even if it's a charlatan medium, right. you know, if they're, if they're doing it, I don't know if that's. Right. And it makes you wonder also, okay. Greg, how much he really like deep down inside knew it for lack of a yeah. better word, subconsciously knew it, but it was like you said, it comforted him. It's like, I'm going to go with this version because Hey, I'm happier this way. Right. Sometimes life is more interesting in the way we perceive it. Of course. And just, just, Leave it alone. You know, some, some of the, uh, the absolutely amazing things, you know, um, it, they're, they're all these stories about the moon, right? Uh, you know, just the moon is this amazing thing. Well, and then we get astronomy, then we look at it, and then we, you know, get really close to it and get on top of it and figure out, yeah, it's a big rock. There it is. Well, that took all <laughs> the um, I, I like the, you know, the cheese, the moon, you know, made yeah, out of cheese. Exactly. Thing. Yeah, that's a lot better. I like that. Right. Yeah. So. And I mean, I'm sure you've heard of all the the stories that you hear like that when, you know, there's a full moon and that people are crazy and that emergency rooms are overrun or more than usual because hey, it's a full moon. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it, it and then you think, OK, how much of this is actual influence or people, even the crazy ones believing or having heard of that as far as being in right. And, and then they're, they're acting out just because they're expected yeah. to. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I've seen you that. I don't happen. know which comes first, the chicken or the egg as far as, as stuff like that. But yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I, I like science. I tell everybody I like science and everything. And, and I think that, will and I tell everybody, you know, nowadays we have so much technology that's so rapidly advancing and, by the time you think you've got something figured out, something new's come along, and I think that that's why we've got a big uh, thing with all these superhero movies. That there's one coming out oh, every yeah. month because I think people, after a while, they still want if they can't have the outright mystery, they want kind of the something that's not quite real. I think human beings sure. always need a yeah. little bit of uh, either mystery or uh, something beyond what's that can be totally explained or quantified. Right. Or, or it might be even just hope to think that maybe one day the humanity can be like that or, yeah. or you know, I have in the ability somehow inside me uh, of that sort of thing. So, well, yeah. Yeah, it, it, and this is the thing and I'm going to I'm going to do my little I say, you know what, what, what before when you had superheroes like Batman and Superman, the original ones, you know, they were like, uh-huh. of course, they were do gooders or they fought crime, whatever, whatever. But overall, they were considered normal human beings. Nowadays, these superheroes sometimes are very, very flawed. 
So it's like, oh, yeah. like a superhero. Yeah. It's like, God. Yeah. I, I I've often talk with a friend of mine, Sean Freddie, um, and that's kind of from the Norse uh, mythos and, uh, you know, the, the Greek mythos as far as, you know, the gods from their perspective interacted with human beings and they screwed each other over and they had, say, you know, had sex out of wedlock and they had, you know, affairs and I mean, just all kinds of manipulation going on. Very so, yeah, life. it's, yeah. Yes. As opposed to a, a Christian view of, you know, angels, demons, God, yes. saints, exactly. um, and that's, and then the flawed humans. Well, but, and, uh, and, yeah. and it's like almost like the, I mean, when you look at, um, I'm going to give you a perfect example, uh, like Batman. Let's say Batman. Batman, I remember when Adam West, you remember when they had the TV series, he was like, oh, yeah. really straight arrow, Robin. And now he's turned into like, a high functioning sociopath, you know, the dark knight, right. you know, this guy's that you're lucky that he's decided that he's going to do away with just bad guys because he's very flawed and mentally disturbed. And it's like, what happened to just Adam West? <laughs> yeah. Well, Adam West, yeah, he, um, the TV show was, did certainly did not follow the comic books. Oh, Let's no, put it that way. They, yeah, they, they, they brought a little bit darker. I was, uh, I did, uh, the, paranormal panels uh last weekend at uh wizard world comic-con here in austin oh really okay yeah and that that was a lot of fun and uh so we we got to why we got to talk about how mythology how lore uh affects society and uh, affects our future and what we do and how we do it and our perspectives of it uh and it was it was a it was a great great discussion so well, no, it's it, no, and I know that you know with with the original comic books or with some of these later graphic novels that have come out, um, and I understand that, especially if it, you know that I know that you know always there had to be some like a lot of these stories, and even if you want to look at a myths, you know a lot of things spring from tragedy. You understand right. because oh yeah, this is the way to explain when stuff shit happens to you you know this is yeah the, I, you know I've the gods were angry best. at with you yeah. or they were jealous of you or whatever uh, and i know a lot of these tragedies comics, they, sure. some of them more than others and it, uh but but sometimes i think they also swing though lately more in the direction of really dark dark i mean before there was the good guy and the villain and now all of a sudden it's like who's the villain in this or you know who's the flawed one it's like right so yeah. yeah, it makes for more interesting. And, and I've and um, I've heard, and I don't know how accurate this is that you know, with a lot of the movies that have come out, that uh, they do much better when they're made to towards adult audiences. Like for example, Deadpool, you know, right? Yeah. Versus the ones that are kind of aimed more towards a younger audience. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. You know, adults like this stuff too, but especially if it's if the the humor or whatever's going on as far as the mental processes is more realistic right yeah but yeah that's and, and 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 you know it's really funny when you talk to a lot of people that that collect comics or study um you know the the social aspects and cultural aspects of comic books and and the influence on society and everything it's real interesting on how different people have different perspective, you know, perspectives on it. Uh, you know, disciplinarians, let's say somebody who's very religious uh, or, or believes in demons or another person that believes in ghosts, another person believes in spirits or aliens or time travelers or dimensional shifters right. or whatever. And you look at it and they all look at those things from their perspective as opposed to, you know, when, when you had done my bio, we talked, you know, you mentioned that, I study complex adaptive human systems and right. and that's one of the things I look at is how does the experiencer process and understand what happened to them. Okay. And that that's something really fascinating because, you know, uh, a person that is brought up in a very strict type religion will relate to their experience from that point of that religion. Mm -hmm. It has to be pretty pretty uh, out there for them to, you know, get outside of their religion and, and, and try to view it from there. But 
it's it's fun to look at and it's fun to see how people well you know what that example that you gave you know you will have let's say let's say like you know a person's perception is their reality in other words and of course that's why everybody has their own different reality but let's say like you said somebody religious something bad happens to them some people will see it as this is the left hand of god maybe if they've been straying away from religion let's say for example right. like that's exactly. the left hand of god trying to help me get back into doing the right thing yeah it, it's yep. because that's yep. the way they were brought up to look at it that's right yeah, that's you know it's it's uh it's yeah we're definitely um even though it's it's kind of weird we're different but in a way i know that the way that human beings think is almost it's repetitive uh i had heard and and i, I can't remember the source that they said that if you look at let's say the headlines for the news and you take out let's say uh time or dates as far mm -hmm. as that some of the bullet points for news from 100 years or 50 years ago to today they're almost similar very similar if you take right. out identifying features as to where but it's almost like the same thing that you right. know we're hearing or dealing with in other words but um, yeah so and when you um when you do something let's say as a paranormal detective i'm going to go into um have you ever been asked to do an investigation uh having no. to do with a paranormal per se <laughs> Yes. Um, at, at work. Yes. And of course we don't do that. <laughs> um, it's it, there, there's usually, you know, a lot more, uh, uh, stuff going on with whoever that is. That's, that's reporting this. Right. And that's something that, I mean, people look at differently. Uh, I mean, if you, if you go to work for a large company and you have to get a, a uh, some sort of clearance or whatever and they, they require you to do it, let's say a personality evaluation. Right. And you do, let's say the uh, uh, MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Right. And that's what a typical uh, government and a lot of uh, large organizations will make you do. And it's, it's a 500 or 600 question test. And you lose points if you ever say that you – believe in aliens or seen aliens or seen ghosts or had experience, you actually lose points sure. on your evaluation. Yeah. And so those are something that, you know, everybody is, is, um, uh, tries to avoid is, uh, you know, some sort of stigma. And that, that's something, you know, when, whenever you say people will go, well, so you're a, you're a, um, paranormal investigator i'm like <laughs> yeah, i'm, I'm like, a uh, i'm a paranormal researcher i'm a paranormal explorer and uh, right. i look at it from a full perspective of being a detective and i've had people go well what's the difference between a detective and an investigator well it, it's all semantics i think but a detective you know like myself would have let's say five weeks of just interview training right now you're showing up every day, Monday, and you work till Friday, and all you do is look at how to interview somebody, how to interrogate somebody, and how to cross-examine somebody. Right. And then in that, there's multi-levels of that as far as picking up cues of deception and, and you know, and, and, and deception isn't always lying about the event. It could be they are trying to skirt around some evidence that would take the detective in their direction on a separate case, you know, like they're, they're there for a robbery, but they've been smoking weed all day long. So they're, you know, they start lying to you initially because they don't want to be involved. Yeah. They're, they're, they're worried high. about yeah. yeah. They're worried about something yeah. completely different than the murder, you know? Yes. And uh, so, and you pick up cues of deception on that. It's like, okay, this person's lying to me. But it doesn't mean they're lying about the crime. It could be there, you know, it, it could be some other deception that's going on. Sure. So I think a lot of that uh, as an investigator, uh, you know, falls into credibility and it falls into, are you actually trained to do this? Or have you just been watching, you know, right. Ghost Hunters International and <laughs> decide that's what I'm going to do? You know, there's, there's. And I, I'm not picking on Ghost Hunters International. I could have named anybody, but you right, know, no, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly. You know, what it, you mean. It, it it matters your training. It matters your experience. Uh -huh. and It matters whether you're you're trained in actually doing research because right. you can find some things that uh, 
appear to be credible and they are absolutely not. No. And so, that, you know. Yeah, it's, it's you know, and um, I tell everybody, one of two things. Sometimes you have people that's not that they're lying. In other words, they truly believe what they saw or experienced as what it is. Right. It's because they believe it. It's not that they're lying. They truly believe it. Even if what they experience has a rational explanation, when you ask them about it, they're as far as they're concerned, they're telling you the truth and they believe it's supernatural. Okay. Right. Yeah. Or, and um, I tell everybody, you know, when I haven't, you know, done, you know, because I used to do a lot of the preliminary work on some of the investigations. I went out for a research group that that just covered the state of Florida. I would tell them, uh, I would always talk to anybody that was, that had witnessed or lived in the house. I would say, I would I, don't, I wouldn't go to another room. I would take him outside where they were absolutely sure that they were out of earshot of any of the other members. Because you would be surprised what people actually tell you when right. they're sure that they're alone and they can't be overheard. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I've, I've been accused of being a debunker and I'm not a debunker. But if it's mm-hmm. not paranormal, it's not paranormal. Yes. You know, I, it, it has a lot to do with what is as an investigator. What is my purpose? Well, you know, what what is my goal? Is it to support the legend of a ghost, uh-huh. or is it to uh, find out what is going on to cause these people to experience this? So there, there's two different ways to go about it, and you know, a lot of people have hijacked this word skeptic oh, and. and, yeah. and and people in the paranormal world use the word skeptic like it's a four-letter word. You know, it's, it's a bad thing. Well, skeptic I is bet. floating around someplace between the word gullible yes. and the word cynical. Yes. Skeptic is someplace there in the middle going, okay, based on my experience and the evidence presented here, I'm going to go with this or, or whatever. Absolutely. It might be. And that's and. and- and you ha- and I, I tell everybody, um, you know, unless you're looking for the sensational angle, if you are a paranormal investigator, researcher, whatever you want to call it, with their salt, you set a very high standard. And before you start even going in the direction of this has got a supernatural origin, this is paranormal, first you're going to go through a checklist of normal stuff, as in pipes, the wind, the raccoon in the attic, and or... Do we have somebody that might have a mental disorder, a mood disorder, or is they taking drugs? There's a score of things that could account for what they're describing before you actually get to, okay, now we might have something here that is not of this world, whatever, and you take it from there. But I tell them, I personally, I set a very high standard because I have experienced what I call the real thing. So... Uh, no, I, I'm a worse skeptic than a lot of well-known skeptics. <laughs> well, and that's I, I skeptic is a good word because otherwise, you're a jackass or you're just gullible on everything. Of you know, course. and and it, it's funny because there's there's some people. Uh, Michael Schwarmer is one of them. Yes. Is, is a great guy, um, but. He's not a skeptic. He's a cynic. And he, yeah. and, and because of the amount of research he's done and reading and, and all that stuff he's done and experienced, uh, maybe he has the right to be cynical. I don't know. Well, but when, when he immediately rolls his eyes, yes. when you bring up the word paranormal, right there tells me exactly what his agenda is. Okay, but think – this is the way because I've seen it. He's invested in this identity that he's created, this image of himself. He's invested in it. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So if I, let's say, I'm not saying I, because I'm not there, but maybe if he ever really truly had any experience that he could account for, he'd be like, shut up. <laughs> Don't say anything. Right. Because I've had all these years and this image and profile out there that, hey, like you said, I roll my eyes and it's all explainable and all these people that are just thinking right away it's supernatural they you know it's he's got a personal investment in that so sure and, and i think I'm, it's michael Shermer, not Shermer. it's Shermer. Well, I, I, I but know, yeah he's, he's been around for a really long time oh yeah and and i love you know his ted talks and and i actually uh have a uh 
one of the great courses I ordered and uh, and took that. And it's, he had like 38 lectures or something like that on skepticism. Mm -hmm. And because I, I wanted to see where he was coming from. And he's got great, great, great examples of, you know, um, not properly interpreting the data, you know, whatever that might be. And also, you know, people say, uh, there, there's a good example of what he gave an example of a red panda. Um, it was in the Rotterdam Zoo. And this red panda got out of the zoo, wasn't in his enclosure, and they uh, put this on the news, right? Well, there were hundreds and hundreds of red panda sightings everywhere. Come to find out a couple of days later, the panda's still in the zoo, and he's actually dead, and he never left the zoo. Where did these 500 reports of red pandas all over Rotterdam, Rotterdam come from? And, you know, it, it's going to come from one. So some of them are going to come from hoaxers just playing around. Uh, some of them are going to come from people that are really looking for me, you know, paranoid and looking for the red panda. And they, you know, see an orange cat run through the thing and all they catch the is his tail. It's like, oh, there's the red panda. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but it was a fantastic um, study of how this happens. And people ask me this all the time, like, well, why would people be why would people lie to you about this for a million different reasons, man? You know, there's two types of lies. There's there's lies of commission mm -hmm. that I did something great or whatever, or lies of omission that I didn't do or I didn't know about something. And so we had a. Uh, uh, a serial murder or a spree murder, I guess, uh, here in Austin, um, 20 something years ago, uh, it's called the yogurt shop murders. And these girls were, uh, the, the yogurt shop caught on fire. The cops went over there, the fire went over there, put it out looking around in there. And there's, there's some teenage girls stacked on top of one another, Whoa. burned to death. Or, or just, you know, burnt to get get rid of the evidence. Right. Well, in the subsequent year long, actually, the, this investigation went on for years. Uh, no one was ever convicted. Well, no one was ever permanently convicted of this. Okay. Some people were put in jail and, and that sort of thing. But the kicker was over 40 people admitted to doing it. And so <laughs> you, why, why would a person that's not in jail walk up to the cops and go, hey, Yes. I killed those girls. I caught that place yes. on fire. We had over 40 of them say this. Yes. Yeah. So I, it's I incredible can't... how many, sometimes I yeah. think that the human's biggest fear in some cases being ordinary, even if I have to admit to something like that. You are absolutely right. And I'm, I'm not, there is stuff going on out there that I don't understand. I don't know what's going on. I'm trying to find it and I'll, I'll continue trying to find it till I'm, till I'm there. Um, but that's just how things happen. That's just the way I had a, I had a, a case where, um, a prominent lady business, business owner, um, you, you talk to her at the store uh, or at, at her business or whatever, just as normal as anybody. When she found out that I did paranormal research, she confided in me and told me about her experiences. And she told me that she was abducted. She continues to be abducted multiple times a year. The aliens come, freezes time. She can move, but nothing else in the world can move. Okay. And she sees the spaceships and they, they do experiments on her and that sort of thing. Right. And so I said, okay, so first thing we need to do is uh, I can get you an MRI. It's not going to cost you any money. Mm -hmm. And let's get that done first. And she refused. Oh, and I said, well, why, why would you refuse? Well, I just, uh, I, you know, this is an ascension type thing. Yeah. Uh, this is the a next, next level that human beings are going to. And, you know, and so she just basically, uh, you know, I talked to her a few times after that, but then she just quit talking to me at all. Yeah. Um, because kind of what you said, um, she would rather... So a, a doctor, right. it's, it's, a, a uh, regular person would sit here and go, okay, you're experiencing something mental going on. Let's figure it out. And Right, let's rule out she, the... Yeah, she would rather 
uh, have the thought that she is being abducted by aliens than that she has a brain tumor or epilepsy or some other sort of thing that's going on with her. Um, and, and like you said, you know, people yeah. want to be a part of something. They want to be something special. And, and, and I get it. I want to also. That's why I work as hard as I do so I can, you know, do these uh, these events and, and, and travel around uh, and, and try to figure it out. I, I've, I've done uh, 22 events this year, and um, I don't know how many I'm going to do next year. I don't think I'm going to do so many next year. You know year. what? I'm gonna it's, in, it's incredible that you mentioned that because I was doing some research on something else that I'm working on, which was because, I, you know, I, I I have worked as a hypnotherapist, and, I, you know, I know that a lot of these alien abductees, they do regressions, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I believe me, I'm a subconscious behaviorist, and I – very much know and understand the power of the subconscious mind. But anyway, getting to the point that you just said, it's incredible that just earlier today I was reading up on this, how they were talking about people that have recounted uh, like like exactly like what you said. Not only once, but many times alien abductions. They said 80% of women will describe some type of sexual, uh, you know, where they were harvested, their eggs were harvested, uh, and men 50%. And that they equate it during all these times that they say that they've been abducted, equivalent almost to a rape, even though it wasn't technically the rape right. the way we see no. it. Yep. But they equate it to. But then afterwards, that, you know, sometimes they have, I guess, I don't want to say group therapy, but we're groups where they've gotten together. Even though they feel violated, they still feel, they feel that they have this close bond with their abductor, uh, ET abductors, if you want to call them that, because that they're there here to help and that they feel that they're part of something special. I'm like, wait, stop. Where does the part about being violated and abducted? And it's like, that's where I have a problem with, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist because I really have no proof to say it doesn't, but there's something wrong with your psyche where... Uh, abduction, possible rape, you, you know, and um, th- it's almost like there's something masochistic in it and you identify and you're special, like you said, because what's worse than that being ordinary? <laughs> and by the way, ordinary average people are usually the happiest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I've yeah. seen that too. They are, they are, they are. Uh, yeah. What do I say? Anonymous and happy. Thanks. And when I mean anonymous, I don't mean nothing about being self-effacing or nondescript. But people, uh, you know, it's almost like if being anonymous or ordinary is like, you must be such so miserable. And I'm just like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but it's incredible that you mentioned that. And I was just, I was doing a, a little bit of research on that. Uh, as and, and I guess in a way, to figure out, okay, of all these people, like you said, that have these experiences, okay, let's we'll pull out the ones that imagine that they've got something going up and up here with their nut, you know, maybe people that are doing drugs, blah, 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 you know. Where are the ones that really truly have had that experience, either one or or like some of them described, sometimes starting in childhood and into adulthood, you know. Right. It's. I think it's, it's, it's just like, Think about it. I mean, if anybody thinks that besides the, the, the fact of uh, uh, being abducted, uh, that I'm thinking to myself, I, 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 I don't know. I just think that there's something there that, that I'm still trying to figure out as far as how it relates to the way us as human beings think of these things. Right. I, when I was in uh, I, I was in high school and I worked at Pizza Hut and I was a um, assistant manager at Pizza at the time. And I had hired this uh, lady, like this girl, she was like 23, maybe 22, 23. Uh-huh. As a waitress, I was like 17 at the time. And um, I'm standing in the kitchen area between the prep table and the ovens. And she walked straight up to me from the floor, past the cash register, straight up to me and had this look of absolute terror on her face. And 
this is before poltergeist and all that stuff. And she goes, they're here really loud. Right. <laughs> and you must have been like, yeah. And I'm like, what the hell? And so I grabbed her hands and she, or she grabbed my hands. I don't remember how it happened, but and we're, we're sitting there holding hands and she just locks up like a, a stiff board. Ooh. Right. Yeah. And her eyes are bulging out and she's just as stiff as a, as a piece of wood. And she immediately starts urinating on herself. Oh and my. she, yeah. And there's this puddle and there's people standing at the cash register trying to check out. And I'm sitting there, they're looking at me and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. And um, yeah, so this, I'm, I'm trying to get her to come to the back, but she's just stuck there. Right. Okay. And so, you know, I'm trying to talk to, Hey, are you okay? You know what I mean? So I was, I was looking over one of the guys. Yeah. Call, call the ambulance. We didn't have 911 back then. And, uh, so, uh, you know, somebody is getting on the phone and I'm talking to her and then she kind of starts relaxing after a minute or so. It seemed like an hour, <laughs> but it was probably a minute or so. She starts relaxing a little bit and then she started shuffling. So I shuffled her back to the back and set her down at a little break table, uh-huh. uh, went up there and tried to start cleaning stuff up and trying to figure out what's going on. I go back there and talk to her. She's smoking a cigarette back there and you know, once she was able to talk, she said that it's been happening since she was a little kid that the aliens abduct her and they'll abduct her in the middle of the day, just like that. And they take her and do all kinds of horrific experiments on her and torture her, basically. Uh, and then she comes back and there's, a, you know, she's missing time and space and and doesn't know what happened and, and you know, exactly. And uh, And that was one of those cases where she she did this an, another time there and we sent her home and I talked to my general manager and he said, man, send her over to the, the doctor's office and, and Pizza Hut will pay for it. We got to figure this out. Right. So she went over there and I don't remember if it was an MRI or whether it was a CAT scan or whatever. But anyway, she had a big lesion on her Ooh, brain. I was about to say, when you were describing that, was like, is she epileptic? Or Yeah, yeah, it was, an, it was epilepsy. That's what they diagnosed her with was okay. epilepsy. But here's the question. Uh-huh. Did the epilepsy cause her to have these seizures and result in this scarring on her brain? Okay. Or did the abduction of the aliens cause the scar on her brain to cause the epilepsy? So you and I probably know what the right answer well, is to that. But you can't, you can't necessarily eliminate the possibility. But let me ask you, when, when she stiffened up as a board and she was urinating, is this the time that, in her mind, did she think that at that point she was be, she was she had been abducted? Yeah. Yeah, it's, she has the experience, okay, while, she has the experience while that's happening. Yeah. Except you were there telling her, no, you were peeing. Okay. Yeah, you were standing right here. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, and she said, no, they, they take me. Right. You know, and it's like, all right, well, I'm, I don't know. I, but, but that's what I always fall back on as far as the paranormal. Okay. Uh, so they diagnosed her with epilepsy. We have physical evidence that she has a lesion on her brain right. in an area that would cause some paralysis and okay. other uh, other problems. Uh, but was that lesion always there? Did she have an accident as a child and caused this? Yeah. Was there a disease that caused it? Um, and and are these experiences that she has a direct result of the scarring or is the scarring a direct result of the abduction that she's experiencing and the, the damage that, you know, the, the, the torture that they're, they're putting in on her. So, yeah. That's, it's, it's, and, uh, I mean, she's, I it sounds like what she says she's having them since she was a child. Yeah. What? Yeah. And that was it's, like, uh, that would have been 1979, I guess, is when that happened. When she was working, 1979, 1980, something like that. And you know what? It's it's and I'm and I'm going to give you because one of the things that people don't realize is that there's a lot of people, depending on your suggestibility, that walk around hypnotized. And I've yeah. had I've spoken to some people that have described you know what they call the missing time, like oh I, and I'm like, you didn't go anywhere. You were hypnotized. You know how people will say I got home and I didn't know I like missing time. I got there and and I go no, you were hypnotized. People don't realize right. that you could walk around and basically function and drive your car. And be hypnotized, 
especially yeah. if you were under some stress or anxiety and depending what's going on with you it's i mean there's a lot of variables with it but where you actually forget like all of a sudden let's say you pull out of the parking lot at work for instance and the next thing you know you're at home yeah and you can't remember the drive and I'm thinking myself, to me you know, there's people times. out there that will say oh missing time the aliens got me and it's like no the aliens didn't get you you were just really hypnotized and what happened that were you anxious there's a lot of things that will put you there uh where exactly that like all of a sudden you're just like okay now i gotta get out of the car i'm you know but that that sometimes the way it's explained but like you said sometimes people it's they want to see it another way yeah yeah <laughs> I can imagine you was a 17 year old. That must have weeded you out. Something yeah, fierce. that was pretty bizarre. <laughs> that was pretty weird. Yes, absolutely. And you handled it pretty well. I'm telling you, because that would have been like, who's here? Right. <laughs> but yeah. wow. Yeah. No, I think, I think that field, um, it's so interesting, but it's almost as long as you kind of like, you know, when there's a bunch of stuff around it, and you go, you know what, in the very middle of this, there's something that's very valid and real, but it's just getting through everything that's it, that looks like it before you get to the real stuff. Right. As yep. far as... It's a lot of distraction and the whole, you know, breaking everything apart and trying to dissect what, well, you know, what are the causes and what are the alien effects of it. Alien uh, alien life. I mean, I mean, we, I, I, I mean, we could do... You know, how much do we know about them? How much do they know about us? I mean, that's a whole different thing because, and it's really funny because you, you'll you get a lot of people that if you talk to them about paranormal ghosts, they'll go, absolutely not. But then you go about the aliens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, what? And then falls right back into what I was talking about as far as the disciplinarians. You know, they just stick in their their realm. You know, if, if yes. something happens uh in a particular way they they'll say well it's an angel or it's a jinn or it's a sure. an alien or it's a, you know a, right. a helpful spirit or whatever it might be but it it comes back right. to what what your belief system is exactly what you expect to see you know what if what if aliens don't travel in the rocket ship what if they travel interdimensionally and yep. maybe that accounts to as to like what you said an angel or or a jinn or a spirit that you know is there and then disappears I mean, it's... And, and that's and that's something that I always found kind of interesting. So that some there, there's several people, I guess, that could probably uh, be uh, coined with this. But the, the father of scientific, uh, the, the scientific me- method, Sir Francis Bacon, Bacon. Yes. Um, you know, if you you don't have to read a lot of, of you can just go to Wikipedia and look it up. Um, but, he, he, you know, one of his foundations was in empiricism and, and then imperii comes from the Greek word and, and it means real evidence, mm-hmm. experiential evidence. Yes. In other words, um, he wasn't minimizing the physical evidence that you would have, but he felt that it was more important of what your interpretation of that the experience as you were observing whatever it was. So if there's a chemical reaction or whatever, in his mind, the chemical reaction was not the important thing. It's how you experienced the chemical reaction processed it in your brain. And, and so that, you know, resulted in the word empiricism. And, uh, and that's where I kind of fall, you know, Michael Shermer would say pseudoscience if, if I, if he heard me saying this, but that's kind of where I fall off of the wagon a little bit as far as being that scientific materialist. I fall off the wagon a little bit and I go, you know what? Maybe all this paranormal stuff is not about electromagnetic spectrum. Maybe it's not about, uh, you know, voice phenomenon. Maybe it's not about whatever these uh, uh, things that we capture on video or on cameras maybe it's an it's a personal thing maybe it's a human thing Mm -hmm. and maybe we're meant to pick up that stuff whenever we need to pick up that stuff and it's not meant to be found by some gadget that you're going to buy online that has you know red yellow and green lights on it yes so 
Yes, I, I, I totally, I totally agree with you. And I'm sure you've run across people that are not psychics or mediums, or they don't have a history of having paranormal or supernatural events. And then something will happen to them. This one event sometimes maybe has to do with family members. You know, people have seen crisis apparitions or things like that. That's that one isolated incident, and they weren't looking for it either. Right. But yeah. it's real, and and, and it can't be explained by the normal things. And I think that happens to a lot of people, and a lot of them just don't ever talk about it. Right. Because but yeah, I think it's definitely part of the human condition. I've, uh, I've had I've, I've had people come up to me and tell oh, you do this, and they will roll their eyes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's great. <laughs> and then 20 minutes later, they'll go, you know, I'll uh-huh. tell you about this thing that yes. happened. I had a guy, he's a multimillionaire. Uh, his wife is a chancellor on the board of an Ivy League school. Okay. And him and I sat there in his living room, and in which he had a, uh, um, a an oriental carpet in his living room that's worth more than my house. <laughs> it was just an incredible place. And he tells me about this experience that he had after his father died and how his father came to him, uh, and he thought he was alive. He, he Right. So his father was in the hospital and he was going to see his dad and he went in the hospital and he went to get on the elevator and his dad got on the elevator with him. Wow. He's like, what are you doing down here? He goes, oh, I just wanted to come meet you down here. And so they're riding up in the elevator and he's like, dad, you know, you should be in bed. And he says, no, no, I just, I really appreciate you coming. I, you, you've been a great son and blah, 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 blah. Right. So they have this experience in the elevator and the elevator doors open up, and he uh, he goes to prop the doors open for his dad. You know, he, he steps toward the door and holds it and then looks back to where his dad was, and his dad's not there. Wow. And so, you know, and I talked to him at length about this. Are you sure it wasn't a, a dream? Are you sure this? Are you sure that? He goes, no, man, that changed my life. He, he was uh, he's, uh, actually from the Philippines and was Catholic. Um, and it completely yeah. changed uh, because he, he had he had strayed away from the Catholic religion, but that brought him right back to Catholicism. And uh, and I was like, wow, you know, he, and it, it was pretty profound for him. And for him to share that with me for no reason, he has right. no, there was no, um, you know, payoff on that. And that's exactly. one of the things that when, when you're talking to people is just like, why would you admit to killing young girls and burning the place down. Yes. Well, why would you want to tell me that your restaurant is haunted <laughs> to get more it's, people in your restaurant? It's it, in like, there's a lot, I think that there's for all, you know, well, especially I want to say what in the last 10 or 15 years where the paranormal has become more mainstream and, and oh, yeah. I've run into where before people were like, Oh, you know, now it's like, I have a ghost. Go- great. Really? What's her name or yeah. his name? And it's like, okay, yep. uh, I thought you were, you were scared. No, no, really? It's like, okay. But, you know, um, but I think that there's a lot of people walking around, like you said, that have had maybe one or two isolated incidents, if that much, or maybe at certain intervals in their in their life. And they keep it very quiet until they come and they speak to somebody who they think is sympathetic and will not make fun of them. And, of course, that they feel yeah. this person will keep their confidence. And then that's when you hear those stories like what you just described. And, and that's one of those things I look for whenever I'm I'm doing an investigation on someplace that already has a, a legend kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like the, the Driscoll Hotel in Austin uh, is the haunted hotel in Austin. That's where everybody goes. It's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it's a beautiful hotel. Okay. And the interesting thing is, is there's a painting of a, of a girl uh, a young girl, probably six, I don't know, four or six years old, eight years old, something like that. And it's in the wall, or it's 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 mounted on the wall. It's a beautiful oil painting. And the lore behind it is, is that was the daughter of a girl that fell down the stairs and died there, right? Wow. Um, so that's that's her painting, or, or the the owner of the hotel commissioned it to to in memorial of her, right? Yeah, uh, did the investigation on the painting. Came from Europe. Doesn't have anything to do with this hotel. <laughs> it's like uh, yeah, 
So, you know, the thing about it is, is you don't want, you know, facts to get in the way of a good story. So, you know, you right. find that out and you go, you know what, this isn't hurting anybody. This is a little ghost story. Fine. Exactly. Let's, let's just move on. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I, absolutely. You know, a lot of things get embellished and made up and, it is, and I hate to say it, especially if there's money to be made in tourism. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, well, but... no, and, and the thing about it is, is uh, telling a good ghost story has a value to it. Uh, and people pay me to tell ghost stories. Mm -hmm. And and now what I won't do is I won't falsify that I have something that supports that story. There's a, there's a story in in Westlake Hills, Texas, uh, called the ghost wagon of Westlake. Okay. And I look at it and I'm like, okay, the, the story is in the 1960s, there were some kids down at this Creek. Uh, it was in, uh, in November, it was kind of cold and it was foggy right there at the Creek cause the water was warm. And they saw this, this team of horses, a wagon with a guy on it and a dog and, a big bale of cotton in the back of it, a big pile of cotton in the in the wagon going through here. And it 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 became apparent to them as it went through the fog and then it disappeared, right? Okay. So I'm looking at that and I'm going, okay, that's that's an interesting deal. And then I look at some other stuff and in a little a couple of years later, still in the nineteen sixties, the same kids are down in that area and they actually found a skeleton. And called their their um, parents, and their parents came down there, looked at, it, and their parents said, "Yeah, we know who this is. This is Maurice Moore. He was a cotton farmer that got killed by uh, um, some Indians out here." So they covered up the the. What's really cool about this is this is on a, a road called Camp Craft, and it is sitting right in front of uh, Camp Craft Elementary School. Okay. And the whole front parking lot of Camp Craft Elementary School is a graveyard. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's like it, you have to drive around the graveyard to drop your kid off. And try, it's this little bitty, you know, like family plot graveyard. But that's right. where this was, you know, this is uh, early or 1840s or so. Okay. The, Eanes, the Eanes family moved into that area. And so they were burying people there. So that's, that's not a big deal. So we got, uh, you know, this ghost wagon that was seen. And then we have this skeleton that's real close to there. And that is a great it, story. I see. I love that when, you know, that story that it's like, yeah, it could have been, a, you know, urban myth kind of deal. And then it turns out right. that there was that person that existed. Well, and the, the interesting thing is, is. I knew who Maurice Moore was. When I read this, I was like, well, that's not Maurice Moore. I know where he's buried. He's buried in Oakwood Cemetery. And it would have been right, right about the right same time. So Maurice Moore was a deputy sheriff and former Texas Ranger and was married to the school marm of the Eames School District, which was about 50 or 60 yards from this location I'm talking about. Okay. Wow. So the McNeil brothers had come in and burned the schoolhouse down because his wife wouldn't entertain them. And so, yeah. And so he uh, he was at, at his office and received a letter. He was at the sheriff's office and the, and the letter was a, um, addressed to the sheriff. But the sheriff wasn't in that day. So Maurice opened all his mail. And the, in the letter, it was the McNeil brothers' father saying, hey, my boys burned down the schoolhouse. We want to make this right. We'll build a new schoolhouse and everything. Uh, you know, we'll do whatever we got to do. But don't send Maurice Moore out here because my boys will kill him. And Maurice Moore read this. It was like, oh, really? Oh, and my so God. Talk about the problems. He jumps on his horse, and he rides out there with another uh, city, uh, city marshal. It takes him a whole day to get out there. And they end up assaulting the house before dawn, and Maurice Moore gets shotgun blasted right there in the door and gets killed. And the, the, yeah, the, the 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 city marshal ran off, and so that wasn't Maurice Moore that was buried there. So I looked a little bit more, and guess what? There was a guy that was a cotton farmer that got killed there, but it wasn't by Indians; it was by uh, some some highwaymen who killed him, dumped him there. 
and then rode his equipment into Austin and sold the horses at the livery and went and gin the the or went and gin the the cotton first and then sold his wagon horses at the at the stables and livery and they were they were never caught. So the crazy part about the whole thing is 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 this legend, this myth uh-huh. is true or it has truth to it. Yes. And, and so from my perspective, like I said, I'm, I'm not a ghost hunter. I'm not a paranormal investigator. I, I consider myself a detective. I've, I consider myself, you know, I've been trained to do a lot of interesting things, I think, when it comes to investigations. Right. And so, you know, I do the non-sexy stuff. I, I, I'm, the, I'm the guy that's sitting at the, you know, the, the historical society going through right. old newspapers and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll spend 90 or 80, well, maybe 90% of my time doing that. And then only, you know, 10 or 20% of my time actually at the location doing it, you know, an assessment of, you know, what's going on there. Well, you know but what, anyway. and that's the thing, you know, some stories are well known, but I tell people, you know what, a lot of times that, you know, I want to go, let's say with the haunting and the haunting of a certain location house. These are the unknowns. These are people that maybe were servants. Uh, these were people that were unknown that didn't make the history books or the newspapers or anything oh, that yeah. documented what went on there. Or in that case, you don't, what you don't think people sometimes got killed and buried at midnight and nobody knew any. Oh yeah, what yeah. happened to them? You know, and, no cameras, and it's like yeah, no that GPS. is the guy that's haunting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's there's believe me, there's a lot of stuff, especially you know nowadays. A lot of crimes went first either undetected or, of course, unsolved. And oh, yeah. um, a lot of them are fodder for uh, for ghosts, if you want to say violent, sudden, uh, you know, death with no resolution. <laughs> there you go. You got them all three. So, yeah, a lot of time. And, it, and it's really funny because um, I was doing some type of research on some stuff and I came across across so many gruesome stories true by the way that I wrote a book about it my second book was about that it wasn't about ghosts it was about these <laughs> really horrible murders that I had right. never heard of and I was like oh my god these are so horrible you know we always think of you know more modern times when you have what we now call serial killers or these really horrible murders and some of them got solved and identi- you know somebody prosecuted others nobody had any idea and I was looking at stuff that was maybe like 80 years ago. And and I, I was like, oh, my God, I never heard of this. But this is, God, this is really bad. You know, right. and it was like, and again, you know, there's so many things that unfortunately that human beings do that, you know, maybe back then they made the papers for like a week and then that was it. And it just right. becomes a forgotten thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that there's that there's something that happens, I think. Uh, with human beings the, as far as our self-awareness and our soul or our spirit, whatever you want to call it, that I think whether it's because you don't know you're dead or if you are, you're just not happy about what happened. I mean, there's a million. I think absolutely there is. <sighs> absolutely there is. Yeah. You know? and, and I've had my own personal experiences, but, but what I'm saying as far as because nowadays everything you want, you know, everything, everybody wants things proven. Um, but yeah. There definitely there is more to us than just when we take the dirt nap. You know, there's there's some of some of us I think that stay behind and it's like want to make their presence known. Something's going on, I know that. Absolutely. Well anyway, Greg, I wanted to thank you so so much for spending this time with me. Let me ask you, do you have any books in the works? Anything new that any project? Um, I'm actually working with Rosemary Ellen Guiley on a, uh, really? on a project right now. Yeah. I, okay. I'm very excited about, um, we haven't figured out a title for it yet or what we're going to exactly the, the, uh, the direction, but, okay. um, but yeah, so it, the, uh, the one that I'm still, you know, uh, trying to get out there is the detecting paranormal book. Okay. And, um, and people are always asking me, well, where, where can you get it? Well, the the best place to get it is off my website, which is theparanormaldetective.com. dot com. So. Right. Okay. And and, and, I, and I, I am going to put a link to the in the credits of the show. But and I'm glad you mentioned it for those 
that are listening to the podcast version of the show as far as, and I absolutely, you know, I tell everybody, yeah, you know, sometimes they'll have books in Amazon, but usually your best place to the jumping off point is the website because I imagine uh, is, you know, do you, do you send out any autographed books? Uh, Greg, or yeah, like it's, well, it, it typically comes from the distributor. It goes okay. through them. But I mean, I can do that. Okay. The, uh, the, the problem is, is, is with, with my book, I have some photographs and I, and it's a pretty lengthy book. Okay. And so Amazon with their discount just <laughs> kills me, man. And I, yes, I, I get like 17 cents per copy or something if yes, it goes I through know. Amazon. So I, I just, I can't do that and it's not worth it to me. But, um, that they, 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 that, that, uh, but, or they can catch you, uh, are you going to be going to any cons? Yeah, so uh, October sixth is my my next one is uh, uh, Utah Paranormal Expo. It's going to be at the Fort Douglas Ballroom there okay. in Salt Lake City, Utah. And Chip Coffee is going to be there. Uh, Andrea Perone is going to be there, okay. and I can't remember who else, but um, that's going to be cool. And then October twelfth, Strange Escapes on Mackinac Island up in Michigan. Mm-hmm. Amy Bruni, I'm going to be doing an uh, event with Amy Bruni and Adam Barry up there of uh, okay. uh, Kindred Spirits. Uh, yes, I've November seen the show. Yeah, that November. now they're showing Kindred Spirits on uh, on the Travel Channel. Yeah, yeah, they're they're kind of excited about that. They're yes. they're happy about that. And then I'm going to do History and Haunts and Legends in Jefferson, Texas, and. If anybody comes to Texas and does anything like that, Jefferson is the one to do. It's really, really cool. It's an old West town, and it's uh, it's got great history. And then the last one is going to be uh, Hunt the Town in Haunted Bryan, Ohio. That's going to be with uh, I'm going to be with the Ghost Brothers up there and the Tennessee Race Chasers. Yes. And, yeah, and and uh, the Rip Files. So they're they're going to be there too. Yeah. So it's going to be really. I, I get to. Uh, 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 Dalian Spratt, Dalian Spratt, uh, with the Ghost Brothers, uh, we're getting a uh, a rental car in Detroit, and we're going to drive up from there. So it should be a really I was I was at Scarefest last year in drive. Kentucky, and I and I met <laughs> them, and and uh, they're yeah they're they're super interesting. There's a there's a lot of uh, people out there that as and and they've got they've got a new version of the show that they're doing as well now. Uh, as far as the uh, what they're what they're where they're going I, I, be, I believe they were doing it a live version is the last thing i saw right yeah, yeah there's a lot of but so there. so let's say yeah that's that wraps my year and at, at uh mid-november i don't do anything again until uh yes. february so I'd, i'm gonna be doing a, an event at the uh, uss lexington with the clean brothers uh in february february 1st of 2019 which is going to be really cool um yes that, that ship is incredible so Absolutely. Well, Greg, thank you again so much. It has been absolutely wonderful to speak to you, and I wish you the best of luck in all your projects. Thanks, and you too. Thank Thank you you a lot. Okay, bye. So, guys, yes, isn't he interesting, God? He is. Okay. I I love it when I speak to somebody like that, that because you know when you do the type of work that he does you have no choice but you have to deal with facts because this is this is what you deal with this is this is what you owe you know if you've if you've got somebody that's been a victim of a crime you know if it's not a murder and then of course you know your credibility has got to be 100 percent if you're going to give forensic evidence at a court hearing anything that comes with it uh so absolutely you deal with facts and evidence and stuff that can be proven and uh, providing that, let's say, to district attorneys or whoever's going to bring that, you know, that case forward. Because, let's face it, uh, sometimes the evidence that's gathered and the investigations done by the police officers are what determine sometimes if something, somebody's ever prosecuted, for example. But then you have the flip side of it, which is he has this background, his own, these personal experiences. And what I really like is that you could tell that he keeps an open mind. And by this, I mean, did you get the people, like he said, that are so gullible, they'll believe anything, anything and everything, even outlandish, even stuff that is like, wait a minute, aren't you going to just think about it and realize that maybe that's a little bit, you know, implausible or 
or what motivating this person. And then you get, of course, the other ones which are like, absolutely not, forget it. You're a liar and everybody's a liar and you're all crazy. Uh, you know, the beyond the skeptics, the, some, the ones that even get to the point that they insult anybody that says that they believe in the paranormal. Uh, and I like his approach, which is I'm going to keep an open mind. Uh, and to, in other words, look at whatever is being described with a fresh set of eyes every time I encounter it. And by this, yes, you do develop experience and uh, where you have a backlog of, you know, I've, I've had, I've been in this situation like this or I've seen something similar to this or what this, this person is describing. But you always leave the door open for this might look like what it, this other case, but it might be totally different or it might go in a direction totally different. Or, I mean, and I'm sure that serves him very, very well when it comes to, uh, you know, whether, I imagine when you, whether you do fiction or nonfiction or the paranormal, uh, because it gives you, I don't know, I, I, w- I want to say, especially in this field lately, where sometimes it feels like, you know, some st- stories are told and retold or places haunted places are visited and revisited by everybody everybody and and it's like like what he said what he described that story about what was going on in this town and and what it turns out was what it was really somebody had been murdered that cotton farmer and and it's like that's what i like i think that that's what really and lends true validation to stories that then when you do the research and you know i'm into the research it's like wait a minute you know what this is an urban myth this really did happen this person really did get murdered so this these people or these kids whoever saw this who had no idea wow this sounds plausible whether it was a residual thing or who knows what I love I absolutely love those stories because I just after a while when you get these places that is like oh god that again another team going there another show going there it's like Mm -hmm. you know and it's like very formulaic and I'm not going to say always but sometimes I've even taken the trouble to do a little bit of research and a lot of what they claim is not even accurate or not true at all at all but it sounds great like I told them hey if if there's money to be made with tourism and by this absolutely don't get me wrong I'm a capitalist, man. Make money. But um, sometimes, man, talk about, they don't stretch the truth. It's like, or massage it. It's like (laughs) totally made up. Uh, And when it comes to the paranormal, I really, truly appreciate when they um, tell stories that are based either in fact or leave the door open and say, you know what? We might not know who this was. Or like he said, you know, this portrait in one of the most... uh, uh, you know, haunted places there in Austin. This hotel is Driscoll. Turns out that the portrait is from Europe. Hello. And you know what? You find that a lot. And somewhere along the line, some owner, some manager, somebody, maybe it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, said, you know what? This would be a great hook. And we put up this picture of this beautiful girl up there. But you know what? We're going to give it a backstory. Romantic backstory, very melodramatic. Uh, mysterious backstory and there you go and the next thing you know everybody believes it everybody buys into it and it becomes part of the haunted tale of that place so yeah that's the part where you sometimes is a paranormal investigator you have to be skeptical that doesn't mean that maybe yeah that there is some but some girl haunting it for all you know she might have been the the, the maid that uh, empties out was emptying out the spittoons and she's the one that's haunting the place not the beautiful girl in the dress with a portrait on the wall a lot of things happen but anyway guys I hope you like the show uh, like it subscribe whether it's on YouTube or any of the podcast platforms so you get notified uh, you know of you know any new shows when I release them uh, I just even though this show's probably going to be a little bit staggered, I just did come back from Toronto. I finished filming a new paranormal show that probably is going to hit the U.S. Uh, I imagine either beginning of next year. Beginning of next year, I'll, I'll give you guys more information on it, but it's 
great, great new angle, great new show. And uh, I was asked to participate in it. And I'll tell you guys more about it as it gets closer. Or, you know, I'll give you a heads up on it. But yeah, there's a couple of new shows coming out. Paranormal theme that are going to be really, really. And like I said, I'm always looking for the new paranormal angle because I look at all the paranormal shows. I don't, I look at all of them. I don't care how campy or cheesy they are because let's face it, when you're in this, you're in this up to your earlobes. And, you know, like a lot of my guests have said, you know, the ones from way back when, you know, when there was only a search of or sightings or uh, all these, you know, you know, one in you know, there was just that one show and then of course it's proliferated, but yeah, I watched them all and I think it's, uh, I was, I I even dug up some shows. I want to say they were like from the seventies. There was one called ghost story. Some of these things that they were like, they're, they're not supposed to be true. They were made up. They were like a weekly show, like movie of the week. Those of you who were around back then, uh, and some of them, you see these really, really, really young, actors when they were starting out and they had some pretty good uh pretty good uh storyline some of them I had even forgotten about them but anyway guys um again I you're my, one of my true believers don't forget to send me your stories uh go to miamiagoschronicles.com and you can go to the submit your story tab or you can email me at marlene at miamiagoschronicles.com I'm still working out on the going live uh, and on an internet radio station and being able to get a phone number out there to get calls from you guys direct. I'm still working on that. What can I say? Uh, It's just trying to to find the right format, the right place, uh, and people behind the scenes that are going to facilitate it so that, you know, I put on something and then, of course, but... It's 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 coming along. It's coming along. But uh, anyway, guys, um, I hope again that you uh, come back every week and you uh, get to either see or listen to the show. If you have any suggestions or if you have any requests for anybody that either has been on the show in the past and you really enjoyed it and would like to have them come back or somebody that you would like to see me interview. Please let me know. For all you know, I've already got a long list of guests that are lined up, okay, which are super exciting, just like Bregg, okay, uh, involved in some aspect of the paranormal, whether it's ghosts or UFOs or Bigfoot or eerie experiences or just everything that's going on. Believe me, there's plenty of eerie stuff that's going on despite all our modern technology and advancements and all that that's going on. That That in and of itself brings... A bunch of other things that I've got some interesting shows coming up on it that you'll go, huh? Okay, guys, thank you again. You're all wonderful. And thank you for spending this time with me. Take care.